Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome if you're on Facebook Live or if you are on YouTube. We'll be starting in just a moment. Uh, in Espanol, un momento, por favor. Now, that's about all my Spanish right there. I can read it a little bit. Well, I had seven years in school. Six years. I wasn't good at the time. It would have helped if I studied. <laughs> I, no, I couldn't get a date in high school, please. <laughs> Yeah, that was the problem. <laughs> I don't think I was ever too shy. <laughs> no. Yeah, my bro Chris was the shy one. Well, good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. I know there's some newer still coming in. I see uh, walking in here, but I wanted to open up with prayer tonight, if you would. Um, I spoke with Carol earlier today, uh, and she has had a really, really tough physical uh, few days. Um, so if you would join with me as we pray tonight. Uh, okay, you two in the front. I'm going to have to separate you. I'm just saying. Uh, I know. It's like I'm back in youth group tonight. Um, <laughs> if I wasn't live on Facebook, the comments I could make right now. Uh, we're going to pray for Carol. Um, she is, between her Parkinson's and her uh, high blood pressure, she is so weak, she's not able to really function. Um, so I've chatted back and forth with her, but if you get a chance over the next couple of days, just send her an encouragement, call her, have prayer with her, you know, whatever you can do would be very much appreciated by me as pastor and by her. Um, so she was feeling better by the end of the day. She texted me back and said, hey, I'm feeling better. Things are going a little bit better now. And, and so just pray with her, uh, pray for her. Um, and then uh, there is, I know, a lot of needs going on in the world right now. Pray for parents. God help us. Um, I will pay off any politician that will let my kids go back to school. I'm not sure that's legal <laughs> or ethical. I hope Pastor Joe's not watching right now. Uh, but, <laughs> but NTI is just, uh, it's of the devil. Um, and it's even worse when, you're, when your kids are special needs. Um, you know, teaching Joshua Braille over the Internet is next to impossible. Um, and Jenna and I don't know Braille, so this is, it's, it's a challenge all the way around. But, um, so the older kids, they're good. Micah can handle it, but the, the younger two, it's difficult. But one of the things I want, as you are chatting with parents in the church, whether they are directly related to you or not, or just you're having conversations via text, email, do me a favor and check within with our parents and make sure they have everything they need to succeed with NTI. If not, the church will step in and we will help provide uh, technology. Uh, you know, if there's a family that says, you know what, we just can't afford to do monthly internet in our home, I will pay for it. We will pay for it as a church. Whatever we have to do to make sure that those kids have what they need to succeed. But what that takes is us being able to have conversations with our parents to make sure that we, you know, get to everyone and say who you need. I will be sending an email out in the next few days and just saying, do you have what you need? Technology, supplies, do you have internet in your home that's reliable? Uh, and, and we'll go from there. I think the vast majority do, but I don't want one family to fall through the crack and their kids are, are suffering when we could provide that for them, right? I think we as a church would all say, hey, I'd give five bucks a month if we need to help provide that for them. Um, and so, uh, you know, Shannon, especially if you get a chance to talk to our parents over the next few weeks as, as children's pastors are checking in and stuff, if anybody says they need something, send them to me, okay? All right, let's pray. 
Father, we thank you. We love you. Lord, specifically tonight, we're praying for Carol. Lord, we ask for strength in her body. We pray against Parkinson's disease. We pray for healing in her body. We pray against high blood pressure. Lord, we pray for physical strength, emotional strength, spiritual strength. I pray, God, that she would sleep tonight and that she would be well-rested when she wakes tomorrow. And, Lord, I pray that she would just feel that she has, is having one of the best days that she's had tomorrow. Uh, and, Lord, may that continue, not just for one day, but, Lord, we just pray over her right now. Lord, for parents and students who are just so in upheaval right now, trying to figure out how to go back to school, do NTI, do part-time, parents trying to figure out their work schedules, all of this confusion. Lord, you are not a God of confusion, but of order. Uh, and so, Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak order into this, this situation. Uh, Lord, we continue to pray that COVID would go back to hell where it came from and that, that we would just be able to move past this. Uh, Lord, we pray that as they're calling this a 100-year pandemic, that it would be a 300-year pandemic and it would never happen again. But God, we know that ultimately you're in control. And we also know we're moving toward the end times. And one of the things that the Bible says is pestilence, and that's disease and different things. And so this may just be things that we have to deal with. But God, we know that the church, when it prays, can hold back the attacks of the enemy that he's trying to bring against us. And so, Lord, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would just push back the enemy's power in this moment. Give our leadership wisdom. Lord, I don't agree with every decision that's being made, but I do pray for them. And I pray, God, that you would give them wisdom. Lord, be with Marty Polio as he leads 160,000 students in our public school system uh, in this next school year, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for being back tonight with me. It's exciting, I know, for, for all of us to be back. I so enjoyed being able to teach to a live audience last week after doing it for, goodness, 16, 18 weeks online where I was sitting in my office looking at my computer and there was no one to respond or to ask questions. I, I miss that. I, you know, I'm a social person. So somebody sent me a text today and said, we have a meeting scheduled in September. What would you like to do, in person or on Zoom? I was like, in person, please. Yes. I need to be in person. I need to be with people. Uh, so that's surprising to all of you I know that I'm talkative. Uh, so we are back in the book, Catch the Wind of the Spirit, tonight. Um, we are looking at two chapters each week as we look at the gifts, uh, the, the ministry gifts that the Lord has given us. And so each chapter gives a chapter, excuse me, each section gives a chapter of an explanation of how that occurs in the local church and why we should be drawn into that current. Remember, we're using wind and current as the themes of this book uh, based around the coracle, the Irish boat. Uh, and so the wind blows them and the current takes them where God wants them to move. And so she's applying that into the fivefold ministry gifts. So tonight we're looking at uh, the forming current. Uh, technically, she's using the term the radical forming current. And then the, the gift is teaching. Um, but as we move in again, we look back to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Ephesians 4. 11 through 13 is the premise of where these five-fold ministry gifts are given to us. I'm reading from the New Living Translation as I normally do. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles. And I want you to, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, I want you to notice that it's plural in each, each uh, word that is used here is plural. It's not singular. Uh, he gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build the church. Again, pause. I want to emphasize this every single week that we teach this. It is those five-fold ministry gifts, five-fold offices, if you want to put it that way, it is their job to empower the church to build the kingdom of God. Okay? It's not those five offices' job to build the kingdom of God. It is all of our jobs to build the kingdom of God. It is their job to train us in different ways and to exhort us and so on. So reading on. Uh, to build up the body of Christ, this will continue until we come into such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Uh, and just so you know, I believe that we won't measure up to the full and complete standard of Christ until we have received our eternal reward, uh, which means there is always room for growth on this side of heaven. Amen. Whether you're really old like Margaret or whether you're really... I'm sorry, Margaret. I love having you back in the room. <laughs> throw you under the bus. 
Uh, you're right, I'm not one bit sorry. She, she tells me all the time I'm mean. I tell her it's her fault. I've hung out with her for so many years. Um, to the youngest person in the church, it is all of our responsibility to be actively involved in the ministry gifts, uh, and it is our responsibility to constantly be learning. Learning is a lifelong process. So the radical forming current is where we begin tonight. So what do you think of when you think of the word discipleship? Now, I, because we're teaching live, I am going to ask a few questions. When you answer, I'm going to repeat the answers so that those on the live feed can hear the answers. So we're not going to take like 15 answers. So just somebody throw one out. What do you think of as discipleship? Teaching, okay. Example, would you say? Learning, okay. Discipleship is the basis of the radical forming current. So we come to know Jesus. That's the wooing current we talked about last week, the gift of evangelism, where we came to know Christ. Once we come to know Christ, then we have to take it to the next step, which is the forming current, teaching. There are many definitions for discipleship, but there is really one central focus, forming us into the likeness of Christ. Okay? You can split hairs on many different aspects of discipleship, and they're all right. But if you boil those down to the basics, it's all about us becoming, being formed into the image of Jesus Christ. Okay? A disciple is a student that adheres to his master's teaching, his master's values, and his master's way of life. Okay? So it is a person who becomes like their master. In the scripture, the word for master that is frequently used is rabbi, which is another word of saying teacher. And so a disciple's job then is to be formed in the image of their, their master. Who's our master? Jesus. Pretty easy, right? For every believer, our goal is to die to self And for Christ to thrive in its place. We put away the things that are of us, and we allow Christ to thrive in its place. We push those things that are not of God out of our lives and allow him to replace it. That is not an easy process. It is a time-consuming process. It is a lifelong process. And it is a process that requires the disciple to be willing to make a commitment beyond just well, let me raise my hand in a service and pray the prayer after the pastor. Okay? We're going to get into this a little bit more detail in a few minutes. But this is a process of learning and making mistakes, of being willing to be taught and expecting the Holy Spirit to change us. This is a radical transformation of who we were into what God wants us to be. It's the radical forming current. Paul writes in Galatians 4.19, 4.19 of Galatians, he says, Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again, and they will continue, continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. So Paul, as the teacher, is saying that he is taking the responsibility of teaching new converts these are very new converts in the early church. Nobody had ever even heard of Jesus in many of the places that Paul had gone. He is so hurting or longing for people to be formed in the image of Christ that he says it's like giving birth. It's like the pains of giving birth. When was the last time you felt that way about your fellow believer? This forming current leads us into the ministry gift of teaching. Dr. Tennant states that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all of whom are master teachers and who instruct us in different areas. So first and foremost, we have to realize that as we are being formed in the image of Christ, it takes Father, Son, and Holy Spirit active in our life. Okay? We can never separate the triune God from our development as a believer. Okay? Now, we do know, we do realize that first and foremost in the activity of our being discipled is the Holy Spirit. 
because he is literally the one that is walking with us on a daily basis. And if we could see him in a physical form, because he is literally everywhere at once, so he is in this room right now, and he is walking with us as Steve walks into the fire department, or Karen walks into Kroger, or my wife walks into OCA as office in, in uh, Middletown. The Holy Spirit is everywhere with us, and since he is there, it also says that the Holy Spirit's job is to lead us into all what? Truth. So the Holy Spirit directs us as we are growing. Part of that growing process is teaching new believers how to listen to the Holy Spirit and respond to the Holy Spirit. Too often, Christians believe that only the spiritual in the church can hear from God. Now, I know I'm preaching the choir in this case. You all know you can hear from God. But in the broader Christian world, Many people say, I can't hear from God. I need you. Do you know how often people say, Pastor, can you pray for this for me? Because I know God listens to you. The implication there is, is that God doesn't listen to me or the, other, the person who's saying it. That's completely false. We have to teach people how to listen to the Holy Spirit. That when they are moving about their lives and they hear a teaching and they say, I get what they're saying, but there's something not right about that that the Holy Spirit then begins to lead us into all truth to show us what is that, why is that not sound doctrine? Why is that not biblical? Uh, you understand the implication of most false doctrine is wrapped in a kernel of truth, yeah. right? When a Mormon knocks on someone's front door, they offer themselves with the kernels of truth that the average Christian would understand, with just a little bit of Mormonism tied into it. And once they've drawn you in with the kernel of truth, then they begin to teach the tenets of Mormonism. And by that time, people are like, oh, I didn't realize I wasn't learning it properly. Why does that happen? Because we don't know the Word of God. Because the Holy Spirit hasn't led us into all truth. Because we've never taught people how to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit for themselves. And as I said so frequently over the last few months... Sometimes to hear the Holy Spirit, you got to shut up. I know that's strong terms, but so often we do this. We, we spend our time with Jesus. Lord, I need, I need, thank you. I need, be with this, be with that. I need this, this, thanks, this. Be with my kids over here, financial blessing over here. Peace out. Amen. And we never shut up long enough for the Holy Spirit to actually speak. Part of teaching people how to hear or to be discipled is teaching them to calm themselves, calm their spirits. In this day and age, we all need that, right? Uh, let me tell you the number one thing you can do to calm your spirit, turn off the TV uh, <laughs> and social media. Those two things will drag you down no matter how spiritual you are uh, because if you're constantly feeding negativity into your spirit, you're going to become negative. If you're constantly feeding yourself with the Word of God, you will remain positive, knowing that Jesus is in control and He's coming back soon. So we've got to teach our disciples how to listen. If you are actively discipling someone, if you're a parent, you are actively discipling, in this room, multiple people, <laughs> in, in most of our cases, either one or multiple people, as we have uh, families in the room that have one child up to families in the room that have five, you are the primary disciple of your kid. The church is here to help you, but you are the discipler, right? It has to be at home. We have your kids two hours a week at best. Shannon has them an hour on Sunday morning, or Hannah has them an hour on Wednesday night, and then we have them an hour on Wednesday night if they're kids. So one hour for youth, two hours for kids. Discipleship has to be occurring in the home. Grandparents too. Yeah, there you go. Grandparents too, that's true. Psalm 32, 8 says, The Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. Matthew 7, 28 and 29 says this, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. See, there's a difference when we teach with authority and when we just teach with knowledge. you got to have knowledge. You can't teach without knowledge. But the knowledge has to be with authority. One of the dangers of 
how do I say this without being offensive? Ah, I'm not worried about it. Uh, if you're offended, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the problems with, the, again, the internet prevalence that we currently have in our society is everyone is an armchair theologian, but very few are actually trained on how to decipher theology. They read one scripture and they read one blog and they think they know all the intricacies of what theology is. Do you know how often it is? Not with this crowd and really not with people in the church as a whole. But as a pastor, people will come to me and say, well, I disagree with this and because I read this blog and this guy said, and I'm like, I could care less what the blog says. What does Jesus say? <laughs> what does the word of God say? And that's what I've spent, you know, my degrees worth <laughs> studying. I don't like to pull out my degrees because I understand everyone knows that everyone can study the word of God for themselves. But you want your pastor to be trained, right? You don't want me walking in the pulpit and saying, I have no idea what the Word of God says, but let me preach to you this morning. No. Unfortunately, there's a lot of pastors who do that. Um, so my goal is always to teach with authority, and then I would add another word to it, an anointing. And what I mean by that is, is that the Spirit has led me when I am teaching or I'm preaching, whatever the case may be. Always bringing out something that you have never seen before. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does for me when I study. When I preached on Sunday morning about the uh, uh, Elijah and Elisha walking through the four spots of history and then Elisha coming back and performing miracles at three out of the four spots, I've read that portion tons of times. Never noticed that before. I found that out because I studied last week. Right? As I was pouring through my commentaries and through the Word of God, one commentator said, it seems as if, and then I went back and looked at it and said, yeah, he's showing forth what happens. Those are things I wanted to pull out so that you walk away saying, I never noticed that before, and our God is awesome. How cool is that little detail that I never noticed before? That's why the Word of God is living and active. It's always, it doesn't change, but it changes in the aspect of what I need today and what I need a year from now are different, and the same Scripture will speak to me in both cases, right? Psalm 23 has very frequently been used as a funeral psalm, rightfully so. But now in the midst of COVID, and we say, though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I fear no evil, what, that's great application in this moment that six months ago we would have never applied to that Scripture. That's why it's living and active. Sunday following service, someone asked me if I considered myself more of a preacher or a teacher. And, you know, really, Scripture doesn't list preaching as one of the fivefold gifts. Pastoring is. Pastoring is more than just preaching a sermon on Sunday. That is taking care of the flock. It's feeding the flock. It's caring for the flock. It's when your bone is broken helping to mend that through the power of the Holy Spirit, of being there when you lose someone, of walking through uh, that cancer like, uh, like Margaret went through a few years ago and has now been cancer-free for years. That, that is part of the pastoral process. I look at it this way. Preaching is more about how it's delivered than it is about the, the content. Preaching is the passion in which it's delivered, You've all been in classes, uh, whether you were in high school, college, wherever, where your teacher talked like this. Let me introduce you to today's topic, ladies and gentlemen. This is so great to have you here. X plus B minus 3 squared equals C to the third power. I hope you all understand. We all get that. There's no passion behind it. You can teach that way. But preaching shouldn't be that way. You should deliver it in a way that shows the passion that you have for the Scripture and the love that you have for the Lord. And so I look at that as more of a, as a delivery mechanism more than it is content. Teaching is the content. But if I had to pick one, I would say that I am a pastor that longs to teach. I love teaching. I love study. I love seeing the results that God's Word brings to those who allow themselves to be taught. Unfortunately, even in the church world, many have an unteachable attitude. Many in the church world say, well, I've heard that story before. I've learned everything I can. Listen to me. You will never learn everything you can from the Word of God. It is 66 books, and the intricacies of some of the stories of the little nuances that we can pull out, you will never stop learning if you continue to dive into the Word of God. That's why, again, part of the discipleship process is encouraging. When I disciple someone, first question I have when I meet with them is, how many times have you read the Word this week? Have you been in the Word of God on a daily basis? 
Did you worship on your own on a daily basis? If they are spirit-filled at this point, they've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, have you prayed in the Spirit every day this week? Use those things to build your faith, right? Um, I think my love for teaching also is what pushes me to constantly want to learn. You know, I'd be a perpetual student if I could afford it. <laughs> I would be like, okay, I've got nine doctorate degrees at this point, uh, but I can't afford nine doctorate. I can't afford one doctorate degree. I was lucky to get my master's. Um, thus, I read and study as much as I can. I'm constantly reading. I, I sat down at my on the bed the other night. It may have been last night with my wife, and and I looked down on the floor, and my stack of books was there, and I started counting how many were there, how many were on my Kindle, and how many were in my office, and I realized that I was reading nine books at one time. <laughs> and that's how I'm always doing it. It takes me forever to get done with any of them, just so you all know. <laughs> because when you read nine, you're not putting a lot of time into any one. But I'm reading nine books right now. I love teaching. Most of you know I teach uh, for North Point uh, Bible College, the, the Assemblies of God University in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Or as Paul corrects me, it's Averill. I'm like, you, you Bostonians can't pronounce H's. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's spelled Haverhill. <laughs> Dr. Tennant says this, how interesting to note in the New Testament alone, teaching is mentioned 74 times, teach 45 times, teacher 52 times, and rabbi 16 times. The term disciple is listed a staggering 269 times. This is contra contrasted to preaching, which is mentioned 31 times, and preach and preacher which are mentioned twice each. So from that, I would even say that one of the greatest roles that the pastor has and can do is teaching. So even if I'm preaching, I'm still teaching. I believe we put too much emphasis on preaching and not enough on teaching. In the, in the older way of looking at it, and, and even back when I was in school, in, in Bible college, they would kind of say preaching is done to win the lost. Teaching is done to mature the saints. Uh, and, and that's kind of a way to look at it. But I say, why can't we do both? You know, so if you notice when I preach on Sunday mornings, I try to bring out something that I'm teaching, but I always at the end bring it back to salvation, right? So those two things can be merged like this. It's like a glove and a hand. They always go together and always give someone the opportunity to accept the Lord Jesus and then encourage them to move forward. So what we have ended up with, because we have put so much emphasis on preaching and not on teaching, there is a large percentage of the church that are very shallow Christians because they've never learned they know the gospel, and they've accepted the gospel, but when it gets into the meat of the word and understanding the intricacies of the word of God, they're very shallow. One of my pastor mentors says that I would rather every Christian be this wide and infinitely deep than 30 miles wide and this deep. Right? Because when you've got the depth, you understand what's going on in the world. You understand what's going on in your life. You understand that when something comes against you, your first thought is spiritual warfare. It's not the person. It's the spirit behind the person. I don't want to attack him, but I need to pray against the spirit. Right? Um, so I believe we have put too much emphasis on preaching, not enough on teaching. We must also remember that the Great Commission did not call us to make converts but disciples. Last week, we looked at the wooing current of evangelism. For far too many in the church, this is where it stops. Let's go get people saved, and then what? Listen, I absolutely would never disparage what Billy Graham did in his life. But I was, even as a kid, I was always concerned when you would see 10,000 people walk forward in a service and sit back and say, but who's going to disciple those 10,000 people? And in reality, if they are not discipled, if we are not discipled, we will not stay in the faith. That's right. Especially in this culture. Let me tell you something. When you stand for something and the culture is against that and your faith is about this deep and somebody says, how dare you have that belief? What are you going to say? I don't want confrontation. I'm out of here. Yeah. 
So we've got to get people where there is a depth. Dr. Tennant reminds us that teaching is primary for the Trinity and should be for us. The wooing current and the forming current must move together. The drawing and the discipling must move together. As the evangelist in the local church spurs us all to share our faith, so the teacher in the local church creates a hunger for growth in every believer. What I, one of my goals is, is I've been reading a leadership book, one of the nine I'm reading right now, that says, you know, how does a church set goals? It's very difficult. In the 1980s, every goal for a church was how many you're running. That is not a, a, the only nor the best way of saying if you've got a healthy church. You can run 10,000 and everyone's faith is this deep. Or you can run 20 and you've got some of the most dedicated believers that you've ever seen in your life that know how to intercede and know how to go after God and are in the Word. One of the things that I desire as pastor is a goal to know that I am, we're hitting a mark that we want to hit, is that our people are constantly saying, when I leave your Bible study, whether it's me teaching, dad teaching, Victoria teaching, Sunday school, whomever, me preaching, Hannah preaching, whatever the case may be, in whatever age range we're at, that they have a desire when they leave this place to be in the Word of God. That they say, for some reason, when I leave your services, I just have this deep desire to pour into the Word of God. That is a success. I have this deep desire to disciple somebody else. That is a huge success. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, you all know it. The Great Commission. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Who has? Jesus has been given all authority. We got to start there. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So if every church needed to say, what are the mark of our success? Jesus just gave three steps to us. Making disciples, seeing those disciples baptized in water because that is the public profession of faith and identification with Christ, and then teaching them to obey all of his command. Oh, that all. Most people are like, well, I'm good with this command, and I'm good with that command. Uh, you know, let's tick them off. There's 12 commands here that I'm good with three out of the 12. So Jesus, you know, if you could do something with the nine, I'm going to follow these three. Right? It says, teach them to, lead, to, to follow all of his commands. Tenet states, the outcome God has in mind to bring people to the point of maturity so they will become like the Savior. Let me reread that. The outcome God has in mind is to bring people to the point of maturity so that they will become like the Savior. She later outlined some of the fundamentals of being a disciple. I realized how much time I had put into this and how much time I needed. I've got about a half an hour for each chapter. And so I condensed about three pages worth into five points that she brings out, okay? So if you read the book, you say, how did he come up with those? I condensed them, okay? Number one, Jesus is leader, we are followers. Jesus is leader. We are followers. Number two, the Bible leaves no choice. A convert must be discipled. There's no other option. A convert must be discipled. Three, and if you're writing these down and you don't get them all, once we go off the air live, I will be happy to repeat those so you can write them down more fully, okay? Three, becoming a disciple means dropping everything for the sake of Jesus. Everything. I wanted to be a politician so bad when I was a kid. And now that I am at, facing 43 years of age in the next few months... And seeing the political climate that we are in, I thank God that he protected me from punching someone in the face. <laughs> because right now we're just so amped up with all the politics. We're just like, ah, <laughs> really? Come on. All of you are with me. Don't judge me. Some of you are looking at me like, I can't believe he just said that. You've all had the urge to punch somebody in the face on Facebook. You'd never do it literally. But in the name of Jesus, no. So becoming a disciple means dropping everything that we want for ourselves and giving it up to Jesus for what does he want for me? 
That applies to every aspect of the life, of our life. If, can you imagine as a young disciple that is single, I'll just use myself as an example, going into Bible college, but not being willing to give up everything for the cause of Jesus Christ, even who I married probably would not have been in line with what Jesus wanted for me. But because even at that stage in my life, I had come to the place of being at Bible college, I had surrendered my life. I met my wife the first semester. She thought it was annoying. Uh, the second semester, she fell in love with me, so I must have done something right. Uh, and she stayed with me for 21 years, very happily, I might add. What would you say? She decided she, liked she decided she liked annoying. Yeah, this coming from you. <laughs> Your, your wife is a saint. For those of you that don't know, that's my brother. <laughs> uh, yes. So number four is self-denial is imperative. Now, let me take that just a little bit broader explanation so you understand how three and four are different from each other. Self-denial for me in this context is me walking into the congregation and saying, what's best for Steve, not what's best for me? What's best for Shannon? Not what's best for me. What's best for Geneva? Not what's best for me. What will help her grow rather than always focusing internally on my desire of style, of, of whatever the case may be within the local church? Well, I wish you had this ministry. I wish you did this. I wish you sang this song. I wish you didn't sing that song. I wish this. I wish that. We cannot be a preference-driven church. We have to be a Holy Spirit-driven church, and that part of that is, is I am always willing to set aside what is best for me than what is best for the body and what is best for the person sitting next to me. I applaud you, church. In the last many, many years, I have never seen one person in this church say to someone, I'm sorry, that's my seat. Can you move? Thank God. It's not your seat. It's Jesus' seat. He's just allowing you to use it on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, okay? But I thank you for that because what does that do to the visitor who walks in and sits where they want to sit, the guest who walks in? No one's going to go to them and say, I'm sorry, you're in my chair. Why? Because it's not about you. It's about that visitor that just walked in. And how can we make this the most welcoming and loving church that they've ever walked into? And the complete antithesis of that is, I'm sorry, you're in my chair. It's just, you've all been there. You've all probably had someone say that to you at some point growing up in church. I know some of those dear saints, they will never name nameless. Um, they're not here in the church, so um, I won't throw them under the proverbial bus. Number five, we must be willing to what? To die daily. We're going to get into this just a little bit more detail in a moment, but can you just, out of that one statement, imagine the amount of Christians living in the world that has never counted the cost for being a follower of Jesus Christ? I would venture to say that even within evangelical Christianity, the vast majority of people who are living today in the church, I'm not doubting they have a relationship with Jesus, that they know him, but they have never actually had to die daily or they've never been willing to. If you don't believe me, go on Facebook for five minutes. So this leads us into the office of the ministry gift of the teacher. Our interaction with the Holy Spirit is vital in everything that we do in the local church. He is our greatest teacher, leading us into all truth, as I said. The Word of God is our constant textbook. There are moments where I pick up the Word of God, and there is literally a hunger within me to not shut it. There are other times I'm constrained by time. I'm a father of four. I'm a pastor of 250-ish. There are demands on my time. There are times where my devotion life is not as good as I would prefer it to be. I always do it. And my wife can attest to that, that there is never a day that goes by that I'm not in the Word of God. But there are times where I can pour into it more than at other times. But whether I'm five minutes or whether I'm three hours, 
the Holy Spirit's interaction with me in that moment is absolutely vital to opening up the Word of God to my mind and showing me what I may not notice. The little intricacies, oh, I never noticed that before. I didn't see that. These two aspects combined form us into the image of Christ. It helps us heal and transforms us into a new creation. Matthew 28, 20, again, says, Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even into the end of the age. So that means the disciple that was in the upper room, Jesus was with them. And for those that are 2,000 plus years later, Jesus is still with us because he's with us until the end of the age. Tenet states that teaching is an important, as important as evangelism in the Great Commission. Teaching is as important as evangelism in the Great Commission. Teachers in the local church must be mature believers. So I'm not going to put a new believer into a discipleship class and say, can you teach this for me? They need to learn first. You can't teach or model what you have never walked, right? And just as a side note, that's one of the reasons why it's imperative for every one of us to be discipling someone because every one of us have walked through different circumstances in our life that can be used to encourage someone else in their faith. There is certainly an aspect of knowledge, but this must be go deeper into a true relationship with Jesus. Teachers should exemplify wisdom and understanding. The root word for the word understanding is bana, which means to build. So the root word of saying teach someone or have understanding is to build. That is what we are doing as we disciple. We are building up their faith. We're building their maturity. We're building their faith. We are building multiple aspects of this walk that we have with Jesus Christ. Teachers must walk through discipleship personally. They must know the word, and dare I say it, they must know theology. You may not need to know every aspect of every theological concept. Leave that to me. Um, And I don't know every nuance of every theological concept. But I do read opposing theology frequently because I want to understand where they are coming from in light of where we come from. For many years, the Pentecostal church looked down on education, thinking that somehow if you had a seminary degree, you were incapable of being led by the Holy Spirit. In some cases, I suppose that could be true, that they buy in so much here that they forget to live here, uh, and, and that is true, and I have some friends that I would say that's probably the case. But like so many things, there must be a balance in our life. To solely seek the Spirit's direction can cause us to move into errors as we may easily miss the Spirit's direction. I don't know about you, but sometimes the Spirit speaks to me, and the first thing I say, was that me or was that the Spirit? We are prone to miss Him occasionally. And if we do not balance that with knowledge of the Word of God, then we get into what? Error. We walk into theological concepts and practices that are not of God. So the two have to walk together. You must be empowered by the Holy Spirit, and you must know the Word of God as a teacher. Knowing the Word, biblical history, theology, and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is the best practice. There's much to be said for historical theology of saying the church has believed this for centuries. Our theology of communion may be slightly different than the Catholics, maybe a little different than the Anglicans, a little closer to the Anglicans, a little, probably really close to the Southern Baptists. But as a whole, we all believe in what? We all believe that the communion is a representation of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and we must partake of it. Even in the light of COVID, August, first Sunday of August, COVID or not, we've figured out a way that we're going to be able to take communion together. Uh, so as you come in, make sure you pick up your prepackaged elements. <laughs> they will be prepackaged, but we will be taking communion together that day. Uh, Dr. Tennant states, teachers must be careful not to share untruth. James 3.1 says, dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Teachers are held to a higher account because we are held to whether or not we are teaching the truth. Have we sought to find the truth? This should not scare us out of teaching, but motivate us to rightly divide the word of truth and to seek the Holy Spirit. As in everything else in our faith, Christ must be our example. We must walk in humility as we teach, not as a know-it-all. I had some professors that were 
even at Bible college, that were enamored with their own mind and their own voice and their humility or lack of kind of turned me off. Uh, we must make sure that we teach what we teach is understandable to the listener and applicable into today's culture. We must ask questions. We must explain the scriptures. A surface reading of the word of God is wonderful for devotional growth, but we may miss the powerful details if we don't dig deeper. And I use two examples here. Uh, I'm sure some of you could give an example, uh, but I'll give you two that's really quick. First of all, Jesus says, I am the gate. Right? I explained this back several months ago, that if you study what that actually means is the shepherds would build an alcove around a cave with rock, and they would leave a space in it uh, about five, four to five feet wide for the sheep to come in and out of. And what the shepherd would do at night, once the sheep were in there, the shepherd would lay in the gate. He would literally become the gate. And so the enemy would have to go over the shepherd to access the sheep. So when Jesus says, I am the gate, he's saying, I'm laying in, the, in that place and the devil's going to have to go over me to get to you. That's some powerful stuff that we don't notice if we only have a surface reading. Another thing is, is how many of you have ever read Revelation where it says, I wish that you were either hot or cold, right? And we've always understood that to mean, well, nobody likes to drink lukewarm water. That's kind of gross, right? But a few years ago, probably within the last 20 years, uh, archaeologists at that city, which escapes me which city it is off the top of my head, but uh, that's neither here nor there, that the archaeologists found that that city, there was both a cold freshwater stream and a hot spring. And so when John is writing and Jesus is saying, I wish that you were hot or cold, the church in that city recognized that we have a wonderful hot spring that is for medicinal purposes, and we have a wonderful cold spring that is fresh water that we can drink. We don't want to be in the middle, right? There's a spiritual application of being lukewarm in the context of that city. We don't notice those things if we don't dive into it more than just a surface reading. Tenet uses the account of Jesus and the two on the road to Emmaus as a powerful illustration. As Jesus walks with them, he asks questions and teaches them the truth of what happened. In the end, the two men implore Jesus to stay. If they had not, they would have never known if it was Jesus. If you read that account, it says they walked, they walked, they walked. Jesus is opening up the scripture to them, showing them what Jesus, who he was, what a sacrifice meant. And it says they got to Emmaus and Jesus led them to believe that he was going to move on. And they begged him to stay. And it says, as he stayed, that is when he revealed himself to them. So if they had not been awakened through the teaching that Jesus had given them and said, we want more, please stay, they would have missed knowing it was Christ. There are many types of teachers. Most commonly, we think of the ones that are highly educated, um, you know, that know the Word of God. Maybe they've been lifelong believers. They're mature believers. There's many ways of defining this. The Bible says of Ezra, uh, this was because Ezra had determined to study and obey the law of the Lord and to teach those decrees and regulations to the people of the Lord, or the people of Israel, excuse me. So study is absolutely part of this. Not every person in this room is going to say, wow, I feel like I have a gift for teaching, because you may not feel like you have a gift for study. That's okay. Not every person fits into every, every one of these five ministry gifts. But as you look around the church, I guarantee you're going to find many people who have that gift. Right? Um, Dr. Tennant lists 16 types of teaching in the local church. It's not a complete list. Those are just the 16 she pulled out. Suffice it to say the teaching goes beyond me in the pulpit on a Sunday morning or here even on Wednesday night, but it can be a Sunday school teacher, a counselor. Joanna is teaching as she gives life coaching and counseling, pastoral counseling to believers who are struggling. She's teaching the Word of God. Well, let's see what the Word of God says about what you're struggling with. Let's see what the Word of God says about overcoming this in your life. Those, those aspects are teachers. Pastor Shannon teaching on Sunday morning. Sunday school teachers, uh, Dad and Victoria currently. Um, other people who teach in our life groups and things. Pastor Hannah with the youth. All of these are teachers. They all have different aspects. 
but they all come together to teach the Word of God. In the end, we must encourage the entire church to move into a radical forming current. We must raise up gifted teachers in every segment of the church and challenge every believer to be both discipled and a teacher to someone. So you may not say, or you may say rather, I don't feel qualified in my ability to study to teach in adult Sunday school with these really learned people. Maybe you're just intimidated by that. That's okay. But every believer should be teaching another believer. Every believer can disciple someone. Right now, we're, we have launched, God help us, in the middle of COVID, we launched a new ministry. <laughs> it was, timing was good, I guess, whatever. But we have the one-to-one -one initiative right now. And that is we are encouraging every believer to two things, be, be mentored or discipled, and then to also disciple. So even if you're a mature believer and you've looked at that email and you said, well, I don't really know that I need to be discipled anymore, we encourage you to do that. Because let's just say we've got two mature believers. I'm going to put Charmaine with Victoria because they're the two that are in front of me. Both mature believers, both know the Word of God. They are teaching each other because what does the Word say? As iron sharpens iron. Right? So one man teaches another and trains, strengthens, whatever term you want to use there. When Charmaine says, I've got a crisis in my life, who's she going to call? If Victoria says, I have a need in my life, who's she going to call? Charmaine. It's about making that one-on-one -on -one connection with other believers. And in many of your cases, uh, right now, we've got about seven people who have come to us and said, I desire to be discipled. One of them is a mature believer. The other six are relatively young in their faith. And we are walking with them with a mature believer who is now meeting with them on a weekly basis, either by phone, Zoom, in today's world. But the biggest thing is, is they know that someone is praying for them and they're there for them. Listen, we don't know if we're going to have to be out of our building again in the next few weeks. And you think about how valuable it would be to have every believer one-on-one -on -one with another believer in this room. How powerful would that be? All right? So I challenge you, I believe this... Um, I believe that it's needed at this time. Oftentimes, Christians feel unfulfilled in their faith. And one of the first questions I will ask them if they feel unfulfilled is, where are you serving? Because fulfillment does not come in the Christian faith by constantly receiving. That's not the basis of our faith. Our fulfillment comes in, how do I serve someone else? Now, that service may look like one thing for a season. It may look like something else for a season. God may move you into a different ministry. God may start a ministry in you. You know, five, six years ago, we had no ministry to the women who were coming out of sex trafficking or are working in the adult entertainment industry. And then Margaret came to me one day and said, hey, I'm going to go feed prostitutes. Or strip strippers is what it technically is, I guess. And so she works with Scarlet Hope. And then Melissa came a few weeks later, a few months later, and said, hey, I'm building a relationship with Women of the Well. Same type of ministry, different ministry, both extremely valuable in our society, in our city. One ministry can't reach every woman in this community. So those are two things that someone came and said, I have a passion to serve in an area that is currently not in the church. And we said, do it. How can we help you? <laughs> Let's, and so even if you guys don't have people talking to you, I tell people about these two ministries all the time say, this is an area you can get involved with. As Tennant points out, somewhere back in the past half a century, we diagnosed the church's problem as a crisis of leading, not a crisis of following. It is as if we read Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship, this book, and decided we'd rather talk about something else entirely. See, discipleship comes with a cost. We have to die to self. It's time-consuming. It's not always comfortable. Sometimes it feels like the Holy Spirit is performing surgery with no anesthesia. <laughs> Cutting something out of us that we so don't want to let go of. Sometimes the Holy Spirit takes us to the woodshed. My dad never bothered to take us to the woodshed. He just took his belt off. I'm scarred for life, by the way, in case you haven't noticed. I know. Actually, my dad very rarely spanked us. It was mom we were afraid of. 
But that woman could fling a flip-flop across the room and hit a, hit a spot on my head from 30 yards. Um, but we understand that there is a cost. There's a cost. Jesus said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. Being hated in this culture is just part of being a follower of Christ. And we as a church, this church, C3AG community, and as individuals, need to be prepared as time progresses that we will be more and more challenged on our moral standings, that we will be attacked because we don't agree with certain things in our society or we choose not to live in that way. And we will be attacked on that basis. It's a cost of discipleship. Cost of discipleship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this. I don't know if you've ever, most of you probably at least have a, a, a surface understanding of who Dietrich Bonhoeffer was. He was an, a Lutheran pastor during World War II. He was in his mid-30s to early 40s. I don't remember exactly. He became a spy for the Allied forces. Because he was a pastor, he could travel in and out of Germany, even under occupation. And so he would travel into Switzerland, pick up messages, bring them back into Germany. But he also was discipling youth, consistently preaching the gospel, seeing, preaching against Hitler, preaching against the evil that was being perpetrated. He was eventually captured, and he was uh, put to death at the cost of his discipleship. And as he was led to be shot, they shot, he was the firing squad. One of the guards made a comment to him and said, you think this was worth it? I'm paraphrasing. And he looked at the guard and said, for you, you think this is the end. But for me, I understand this is the beginning. That is the cost of discipleship. We as a church, Big C, have gotten away from the ability to call people to the willingness to give their life for Christ. I saw a meme the other day from a famous pastor. You never know if the pastor actually said it. Just so you know, I could make a meme in five minutes and throw it up and make it say anything I want. And it could go viral. But this, the sentiment is true. The question is, is if we did away with air conditioning and buildings and soft chairs and heat in the winter, how many Christians would still walk in to worship God simply because he's worthy? There's a cost to it. Many of you are watching Hopefully you're watching limited news. But the Chinese government is cracking down like never before on Christianity. We are seeing that, you know, as our son has adopted from China. We are seeing that within the adoption community that there has been a pushback against adoption and even how that was done. Christian orphanages have been shut down and all those children have been moved into secular orphanages or into other homes. There's a pushback against the church. And this week it is... Uh, the communist government has basically said that if you are not in the sanctioned church, the communist approved church, which there is one, that we will take you off of any government funding. It's a communist government. Every, all the funding comes from the government. We will kick you out of government housing. We will take your possessions, every asset, at least in one case, in one province, they threatened to take their children so that they could indoctrinate them. And they said, but if you don't deny Christ, this is what's going to happen. But you know what happens in China? Every time they push back like that, the church explodes. It thrives. And I'm going to be really strong here. While we are weak in our faith in, in America, and we are, really, we're pansies. We want to be pampered in our faith. People around the world are literally giving their lives and we're crying about silly things that don't even matter. Churches split every day over the color of carpet. When we remodel this sanctuary, can I be honest with you? I'm not asking any of you what color we're going to put down on the carpet. <laughs> and we're certainly not having a business meeting. <laughs> there will be a couple of the board members who make recommendations on what will last and what will match. 
But we aren't going to get into that stupidity. It doesn't matter. I don't care if we put in, we're not going to put in orange carpet. But it, <laughs> Why do you think I'm not putting that in? I'm not putting that in, and I'm not putting in UK blue. Uh, <laughs> but what, what do we say about those things? The church in America has been so pampered, we are so weak in so many ways, that if we were ever called to account of our faith, the great falling away that is talked about in Scripture is going to be perpetrated by pressure coming against the church and Christians saying, I never counted the cost. I'm out. We need to raise a generation of students who understand that it is very likely. And I'm not saying kids. We're not preaching this in kids' church. But Pastor Hannah should be instilling in our teenagers that it is very likely you will give your life for Jesus because of where society is going. I sat in the Speed of Light, and I'm closed with this. I sat in the Speed of the Light banquet a few years ago where my daughter received the, 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 the state award uh, because she'd given, I don't know, $2,000 or whatever it was that year personally. And Pastor Rodney gave her the Ralph W. Harris Award. <clears throat> we have another winner of that in the room tonight. Steve and his twin brother, Philip, both got it one time when they were students. But the speaker that day said this, and we know that our daughter wants to be the M word in the C word that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And he said, let me tell you something. We are beyond, we are moving out of the age of persecution for the M word mission. And we are moving into the age of martyrdom. And here I am sitting on the front row with my 17-year-old daughter, and the speaker is encouraging us as parents to understand the likelihood that if we send our kids overseas or they stay in America, there's a strong chance that they could be martyred. That is what the early church understood. And there are pictures in history books that I could pull out and show you that artists drew of Christians kneeling in prayer circles in the midst of the lions that are coming to attack them in Rome. Every believer in the Roman world, every convert, let me put that again, every convert in the Roman world in the early church knew that they were going to give their life for Christ. They counted the cost. Why? Because the teachers discipled them in such a way to understand that you were dying daily to yourself. In the end, well, let me back up one, one moment. We've got about five minutes left, and we're closing prayer. A.W. Tozer stated, salvation apart from obedience is unknown in the sacred scripture. Salvation apart from obedience is unknown in the sacred scripture. Right? Everywhere in scripture, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. It's themed, it's said in those terms when Samuel speaks to Saul, that it is shown throughout Scripture in action. Obedience is better than sacrifice. In the end, as with every ministry gift, we must be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We must recognize that teachers are just as anointed as the prophet, as the apostle, as the evangelist, or the pastor. When was the last time you thought of your teacher being anointed? Teachers are in the church to train, to empower, and to keep us safe in our theology and our practice. So when revival comes that we all believe it is the teachers in this church that I'm going to lean on to come to me and say, Pastor, I love what's happening here, but we need to be careful right there. And that is a confirmation of what the Holy Spirit's already spoken to me. That's invaluable as revival begins to break out because the enemy wants nothing more than to bring disruption in the midst of revival. And what we want is we want the authentic, right? And so I would caution all of us no matter where you are, if you're the super Pentecostal that's, uh, you know, all in on the supernatural and every single aspect of it, or if you're the person that's a little bit more reserved and you're all in on, let me study, 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 study. None of us know what the last day revival will look like. In previous revivals like Brownsville, somebody would walk across a room and a whole section would fall out in the spirit and be healed, be filled with the spirit. I can't tell you that that's what it's going to look like this time. It may 
But what I'm fearful of is that we have a predetermined idea of what it must look like, either as a teacher that is too conservative saying, well, I can't go here, 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 and here, or as a super empowered person over here that says, whatever, it has to look like this. We all have our preconceived ideas. And what we need to do is we need to be praying for the authentic move of the Holy Spirit because only the authentic move has a lasting change and calls people to the cost of discipleship. The Holy Spirit will teach them in those moments, whispering in their ear when they give their life for Jesus, give their life to Jesus. Are you willing to give your life for Jesus? So teachers are just as anointed, working with each of the other four gifts, the local church is healthy and accomplishing the Great Commission. So again, I'll close with this thought and prayer. If you are not involved in the one-to-one initiative, Send me an email, send me a text, say, I want to be involved, I want to be discipled, or I want to disciple, or both. Because even we have several sets of mature believers who are now meeting together on an ongoing basis and saying, how can I support you in your walk with God? Right? What Carol needs right now, she needs that one person or multiple people that says, how can I encourage you today, Carol? What can I do for you? Do you need me to get groceries for you? Do you mean to bring you something? Do you mean to take you to the doctor's appointment if you're strong enough to help her get to the doctor's appointment? That's what we want. We want to build a community of disciples who are discipling constantly. Anyone have a prayer request tonight before we close? I have a neighbor <clears throat> that fell and broke her shoulder <clears throat> and her mm. wrist, and it's her dominant hand. Mm. Uh, so I've been taking her meals every day. Well, she's been asking me a lot of questions well, and asking me which church to go to. Nice, yeah. Her name is you realize once you start taking people meals, you'll never be able to stop, right? <laughs> if you've never had Charmaine's cooking, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but anyway, I'd, I'd like prayer for her. Cause okay. She's, uh, she's doing okay. She's got a good attitude. We, good. We've talked a lot about it. Yeah, so Charmaine's neighbor fell and broke her, her wrist and her sure. shoulder. So we need to pray for that. Anyone else? Continue to pray for Carol. Yes. You can cut it off. Thanks for being with us tonight. We're going to close in prayer here in the room, but if you're on Facebook or um, YouTube, we appreciate you being with us tonight.